We're going to share the Lord's Supper in a moment or two, communion. But I wanted to, uh, every year I, I tend to talk to whatever congregation um, pastor you're preaching at, uh, as a reminder of what this is about, what this meal. We're about to do something kind of radical at Little Brown Church and this morning. We're going to uh, change the uh, singing of a Church in the Wildwood from the end of the service to the beginning of the service. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see what people's response to that is going to be. Uh, part of the rationale of doing that is the song actually says, Come, come, come to the church in the Wildwood. And we sing it at the end. Uh, I would have thought if it was singing at the end, we'd sing, We've been, we've been, we've been to the church in the Wildwood. <laughs> so I'm sure there's some traditionalists in the church that will be kind of you know, like this. Uh, and I'm not against tradition, but I'm definitely against tradition that's lost its meaning. Uh, if there's no meaning in tradition, why would you ever do it? Hmm? So it doesn't matter what it is. You know, if you've just done that thing, and it's almost like rote, it's just you know memory for you know you do that kind of stuff. You lie in the bed and it stays that way. Um, if that's the case, then why? What's the point? You know, Jesus encountered a woman, uh, a well up in Samaria. And it was an interesting conversation, and, and you would have thought the way that thing went, it would have been a conversation all about morality. Because he confronts her, and she's at the well at the mid midday, which is not the time you would go. She was there to avoid all the other women in the village because they would be, you know, just criticizing her. Because, as Jesus revealed to her, um, you've had uh, five husbands, by the way, and the one that you're living with right now is not your husband. And then she says to Jesus, as he kind of reads her mail and tells her that, she says, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> I love that verse in the Bible because I thought, well, duh. I mean, he just told you everything about yourself, so I guess he was. Uh, but then the conversation morphed into something else. It morphed into a conversation about worship. She's a Samaritan. The Samaritans and the Jews didn't have much in common. Uh, they had some religious things in common, but they worshipped at two different sites, one in Mount Zion in Jerusalem for the Jews and Mount Gerizim for the Samaritans. And so she says, you know, hey, you know, where's the right place to worship God? Is it over here in Mount Gerizim or is it down there in Zion? And here's what Jesus said. He said, no, it's not to do with location at all. It's to do with your heart. He went on to say, he that would worship God, worship him in spirit, that's with our heart, and truth, that is in reality. So it's not about location. And I've said that over, and that little building over there in Nashua, it's not about the building. As famous as it is, as nice as it is, as pretty as it is, we spent about four hours yesterday beautifying the gardens and I am worn out. I've got a sore back, sore feet, and everybody else that turned up probably is the same, so there'll be a lot of moaning and groaning in church uh, this morning, I would imagine. Uh, but the reality is, it's not about this. It's a beautiful building. But it's about you. It's about our worship of the Lord. It's what comes from our heart. And not what we've learned from tradition. It's got to be real. It's got to be real in our hearts. So Jesus said this. He said, Notice, well, Matthew said this. Notice they were eating. Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink all of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in my Father's kingdom. A lot of people get different views of what we're about to celebrate. Roman Catholics actually believe that the bread and wine turn into the actual body and blood of Christ. Uh, Anglicans, the Lutherans have a different... That view by the Catholics, by the way, is called transubstantiation. It, it changes. Something actually happens that changes the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Uh, the Anglicans and the Church of England and the Lutherans believe that it doesn't change, but Jesus' spiritual presence is there, and it's a communication of grace uh, to people. It's a means of grace. Uh, Protestant Reformation um, held to something called the priesthood of all believers. They basically said, you don't need an ordained clergyman to sh do this. You don't. Anybody can share the supper together, as it was in the beginning with the disciples way back in the day. And they shared house to house. They didn't have beautiful buildings like this. They broke bread as they met with their family meal. 
the end of the family meal together, they would say, let's just break bread and drink wine and remember Jesus. And so they would do it every single time that we get together. And so the Reformation basically held to the fact that all believers were allowed to partake of the Lord's Supper, to be celebrated by any group of believers, not just by a clergyman. And most of us, including myself, I believe this is, this is not a sacrament that says that it imparts grace. It's a memorial. It's a memory. We remember. That's what Jesus said. Do this in remembrance of me until I come. Last Monday we celebrated Memorial Day, didn't we? That's the day we set aside to remember, as I mentioned in the sermon, people's names, the names of those who died. 1.3, I think it is, million U.S. service personnel died since the Revolutionary War for this country. So there are thousands of folks around the nation who have lost loved ones in the service of the country. But for them, Memorial Day is every day. And so should be for us. But every day, not just the one Sunday a month that we partake of communion, every day we need to remember what Jesus has done for us. And so this mini message is just called keeping it real. We just need to keep it real. We need to understand what this meal is about, otherwise it just becomes tradition. It becomes a thing we do once a month, first Sunday of the month. There's got to be more than that. So over the years I've developed this little checklist for me that I'm going to share with you with regards to communion. So I want to always be able to keep it real. And here's my little checklist. Right? Number one. First question I ask myself is this. Do I know what communion is really about? Do I understand what this meal is about? It's a time when it says to look back, back to what Jesus has done for us. He says do this in remembrance of me. Okay? It's also a time to look in. Verse 28 says, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink of the cup. It's a time to look back. It's a time to look in. And it's also a time to look forward. He says, do this until I come. And so this meal itself hopefully helps us to look forward to that day that Jesus will return. It's also a time to remember. Remember what we were, you know, Ephesians chapter 1 says this, we were once dead in our trespasses and sins, but he made us alive. So we remember what we used to be, sinners. And what we are now, sinners, still sinners, but saved by grace. Remember what we were, what he did, and who we are now. Second thing my checklist is this. What's the state of my current relationship with the Lord? Again, Paul says this, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. And so this meal is a, a place where we stop and think about, it should be, our relationship with the Lord and what the state of that is. We want to make time to ensure and examine ourselves that our relationship with the Lord is authentic and is genuine. Third thing in my checklist is have I confessed all known sin before I come to church to celebrate communion? It's another part of the checklist. Ephesians, Philippians, you say, says this. Uh, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that would have clean hands and a pure heart. And so we come into the presence of God, hopefully prepared to worship, prepared to receive the bread and the wine in remembrance of Christ. And the fourth thing in my checklist is, am I looking forward to celebrating communion with my brothers and sisters in Christ? It's called communion for a reason. Common union. It's for us to partake together. It's not just a declaration of our love and obedience to Christ. It's a statement of our unity as a body of believers. That's why we celebrate the meal together, not the wrong. I wish we could go back to the first century and see how those early disciples did that. I think it would be a great lesson. What happened? Well, what happened was what happened to the church in general. The church got institutionalized. You know? Church began as an organism. A living organism. Think about this. Day of Pentecost, right? So there's 120 Christians meeting 
But in the upper room of Jerusalem, just as Jesus had commanded them, the Holy Spirit descends, they get filled with the Holy Spirit, they spill it out to the streets of Jerusalem. Peter gets up and preaches that incredible sermon. This guy that had been betraying Christ just days before, he gets up and preaches this amazing sermon. And all the people who are watching, who were all in opposition to Christ before, they were the same bunch that were crying, crucify him, crucify him. Peter preaches and then they say, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? And he says, repent and be baptized. And the book of Acts tells us that 3,000 people were added to the church that day. But just think about that for a minute. So it goes from 120 people in one day to 3,120 people. There's no organization, there's not, you know, the United Methodist Church or the Anglican Church or the Roman Catholic Church or anything like that that's highly organized to deal with the growth. And yet, two verses on it says, and there was not a needy person among them. How do you think that happened? Did that happen through organization? No. It began in the power of the Holy Spirit. A.W. Tozer, who's one of my favorite authors, said this. He said, the church began in power and moved in power just as long as it had power. And then it got institutionalized and forgot about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And sadly, that's what a lot of places are today. People come to church, don't even give a thought about why we're coming, what we're there for. It's just the thing we do every Sunday morning. And that's kind of sad. Because our spiritual life should be real and vibrant every single day, not just on Sunday morning. The fifth thing is this one. Do I have unforgiveness in my heart towards a brother or sister, or do I know, or do I know they have a problem with me that's not been resolved? And so this is about making sure we're clear with everybody. There's an interesting passage in Matthew's Gospel that says this. It says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and they remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there and go be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. You ever had that experience when you come to worship in church and, and there's been something wrong between you and somebody else and you get to this point in time and all of a sudden that conviction of the Holy Spirit comes and thought, oh, gosh, I need to get this right. I don't feel right. I don't feel good. It's that feeling that you have. And that's why it's so important as we come to communion that we walk through a checklist of our own heart. Because, interestingly enough, let me read the whole passage. One Corinthians eleven. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself and then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let it be at home. So that, when you come together, it will not be for judgment. And Paul goes on a lot more. What is he saying in all that? I think basically what he's saying is know what you're doing. Know what you're doing. Don't do something out of tradition, because you've always done it this way. Let it be real. Let it be something that does something to your spirit as you remember Christ and the taking of the bread and the wine, as you remember what he did in Calvary for our sins. Let's make sure 
but we do this in a way that honors him, and not just because we've always done it. Let it be real. That's my prayer for everything that I do in the ministry, and especially this. Let it be real every single time. Let it remind me afresh every single time about what you've done for me, so that I walk away here with that more gratitude in my heart for the sacrifice you made for me. Let's pray as we head to receive the bread and wine. Lord, we thank you for your body that was given for us, hung on the cross. Lord, that took those stripes, nails in your hand and your feet, sight pierced, all for us, that you may give us redemption. So we take this bread as a memorial for what you did on the cross, your body. says without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sins, there's no forgiveness. And Lord, all the Old Testament sacrifices of bulls and lambs and goats, Lord, could not provide forgiveness. But Lord, the heavenly Lamb of God came to give His life and His blood so that we might be free, we might be clean, we might be cleansed, we might be forgiven. So we take this wine as a memorial to say thank you for what you've done on the cross. Let's take the wine. Father, I pray you part us with your grace, with your love and with your blessing. Father, help us to walk in the goodness of this meal that you shared today. And help us, Lord, to every single day be grateful and thankful for what you've done for us. And help us, Lord, in these days that seem to be getting darker and darker to shine more for the gospel of Jesus, to take a stand for the truth that's in the Word of God. Help us to do with gentleness and with respect, but Lord, help us to be strong in our faith, to be ever grateful for you and all you've done. Be with those who could not be here this morning. Watch over them wherever they are, whether they're traveling, or whether they are with their family, or working. Lord, we remember our sister Ellen, who's moved to Minnesota, be with her, we pray, Lord, just surround her with your love and your grace. She's in the middle of her family there. And family, and Father, Lord, help us, Lord, this day to rejoice in your goodness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.